Welcome to Episode 7 of the Wood Whisperer Video Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Spagnolo, and on today's episode, we're going to make this awesome end grain cutting board. Now, whether you make this as a gift or you plan on using it in your very own kitchen, this durable and extra fancy cutting board will serve as an excellent project for honing your woodworking skills. Now, as you probably already know, cutting boards come in several varieties. First, there's plastic. Please. Now, just as a disclaimer, I don't really recommend throwing your wife's cutting boards around the shop. There's also your standard wood cutting board. Now, something like this little guy is a long grain cutting board. They're very popular and they can be inexpensive due to the fact that they're easy to make. They suffice for most standard kitchen tasks. But if you're anything like me, standard just isn't good enough. And that's where end grain cutting boards come in. This colossal kitchen companion is heavy, it's durable, and if made properly, it can be a gorgeous addition to your kitchen decor. So you might be wondering why we care so much about end grain. Well, end grain boards are much easier on your knives. They're much more durable, and they tend to hide your knife marks better. Now, let's use this paintbrush as an example. The bristles here represent a bundle of wood fibers. Now, on a long grain board, we're constantly chopping across the grain. That could lead to cracks in the board, and possibly even pieces of the board being dislodged. It's also a lot tougher on the knife. Now, end grain, on the other hand, is much more forgiving. The blade will chop down between the fibers, giving it a nice soft cushion, and when the blade's pulled out, the fibers will spring right back into position. Now, the traditional wood of choice for cutting boards is hard maple. It's also referred to as rock maple. Hard maple is, well, it's hard, and it has a very tight grain structure, which means less places for bacteria to hide. Now, to make our cutting board, I'm using two woods, maple and purple heart. I chose Purple Heart primarily for its color, but fortunately, this South American hardwood is also very dense and tight grained. Now, there's a lot of other woods out there that you can use to make a cutting board. Just be sure to avoid woods that are open grained, oily, or soft. Before we get started, I just want to quickly mention that if you follow these plans exactly, you should end up with a board that's approximately 18 inches long by 12 inches wide by about an inch and a quarter thick. So, without any further delay, let's get ready to make a cutting board! To get started, we need to mill some 8 quarter purple heart and 8 quarter maple stock down to an inch and 5 eighths thick, and also 15 and a half inches long. We then need to rip these pieces to the following widths, two and a quarter inches, one and three quarters of an inch, one and one quarter inch, and three quarter inch. When it's all said and done, we should have two pieces of each width, one from maple and one from purple heart. Next, we need to arrange the boards for our initial glue up. Each board is in descending order with the largest piece toward the outside. Now notice how I also alternate the maple and the purple heart. Before I apply the glue, I turn every piece but the last one 90 degrees to the left so that the glue surface is face up. I then spread a generous amount of glue on each face. Using an ink roller, I ensure a nice, even coat. Notice that I'm only applying glue to one face. This is a great time saver when I've got a lot of boards to worry about. Just be sure to apply a generous amount of glue. It's always a good idea to throw the roller into a bucket of water so that the glue doesn't dry on the rubber surface. Once the boards are in position, I apply just enough clamping pressure to hold the boards in place. Next, I clamp two calls across the face of the board. This ensures the board will stay as flat as possible. Now here's a quick tip. Cover the business end of your calls with clear packing tape to prevent the glue from sticking to the call. Lastly, I add a third clamp to the middle of the glue up just to ensure even clamping pressure. Let's just take a second or two to talk about glue. Now you can use just about any water resistant glue to glue up a cutting board. But since I like to play it safe, I prefer a glue that's FDA approved for indirect food contact, such as Type Bond 2 or even Type Bond 3. Now I know some polyurethane glues like Gorilla Glue are also FDA approved, but these glues are messy, sticky, and they're expensive. So I stick with my time-tested favorite, Type On 2. So let's take a look at our glued up board. 
Now, you see all this squeeze out over here? This is actually a good thing. It tells me that we've got good surface to surface contact at each and every joint. And the last thing we want in a cutting board is a glue starved joint. Now, to get the excess glue off without creating more problems for ourselves later on, I recommend waiting about 30 minutes and then scraping the glue off. This prevents the glue from spreading over the surface and into the adjacent grain. Now, we're going to let this guy dry overnight before we actually start to smooth the surface. To flatten the glued up board, I prefer to use my planer or my drum sander, but you could just as easily use a block plane, a scraper, or a random orbit sander. Just make sure you get a nice flat surface. Now, we could stop right here. I mean, this is a pretty attractive board as it is, but we're gonna take this puppy to the next level by exposing the end grain through a second round of cuts. I like to start by using my miter gauge to clean up one edge. I then start cutting the board into one and one quarter inch strips. Watch your hands and be sure to use your favorite push stick for this operation. When it's all said and done, we should have 11 one and a quarter inch strips. Now here's the really cool part. All we have to do is turn each piece 90 degrees to expose the end grain. And we're actually gonna create a very interesting pattern. Basically, if you take every other strip and flip it around like this, we get the pattern we're looking for. Now all we need to do is glue these pieces together just like we did the first time. Spreading the glue this time is very simple. Just turn every strip but the last one 90 degrees to the left. Spread a generous amount of glue over the entire surface. Then reassemble the boards on the clamps in the proper order. I like to use a couple of my calls to make sure the boards are lined up perfectly, and then I use them to keep the board flat as I add a little bit of clamping pressure. And just like during the first glue up, I use the tape covered calls and several clamps to keep the board nice and flat. After removing the board from the clamps, I gave it a thorough sanding with 80 grit followed by 120 grit, and now it's time to add the finishing touches. Now, a big board like this one can be difficult to handle sometimes, so we need to make it easier to pick up. I like to use a router with a straight bit to actually create recesses in each end for your fingers. Now, the, the dimensions of these recesses aren't really critical. You just need to be big enough so that a few fingers can fit underneath. I like to make mine about an inch and a quarter by four inches by a half inch deep. And after that, I like to add a quarter inch round over to all the edges. The easiest way to create consistent recesses is with stop blocks and an edge guide. In order to prevent chip out, be sure to take light passes at first and make your initial cut in a clockwise direction. This is known as climb cutting. It's also a good idea to do your routing in two steps. I usually leave about an eighth of an inch for the final pass. This will ensure a nice, clean recess. I also like to use a quarter inch roundover bit to ease all the top edges. Once again, I go clockwise to avoid chip out. And finally, I use an eighth inch roundover bit to ease all the bottom edges. The areas that I can't reach with the router are rounded over with 150 grit sandpaper. Now the next step is to give the board a final sanding to either 180 or 220 grit. Now keep in mind, since the entire surface is end grain, the sanding is going to take a little bit longer than usual, but just be patient. If you see any little white scratches on the surface, you need to sand just a little bit more. Now it's time to talk a little bit about finishing. There are a number of ways that you could finish a cutting board, and there's a few things to avoid too. Now if you do a little research, you'll find a lot of conflicting opinions, and truthfully, none of them are really wrong. You just need to decide which is best for you. Now I'll demonstrate the most popular methods, and we could discuss a few of the others. 
First, there's mineral oil. Now, you may see this stuff sold as butcher block oil, but please, don't waste your money like I did, and just go to your local supermarket or pharmacy and pick up some food grade mineral oil. It's odorless, it's tasteless, and it does a great job of repelling moisture. It's also an easy finish to renew whenever the board needs it. When applying mineral oil, the goal is to give the wood as much as it'll absorb. Flood the surface and wait several minutes. You keep adding oil as long as the wood keeps soaking it in. Wait five to 10 minutes and then wipe off the excess. After 24 hours, repeat the flooding process. Apply two to three more coats this way and your board will be fully seasoned and ready for the kitchen. Now a variation of the mineral oil finish involves the use of a wax, either a beeswax or a paraffin wax. I usually start this process on a board that's already received one or two coats of mineral oil. I warm up about a half cup of oil on a hot plate with a heat setting on low. Using a wooden mallet and a knife, I break off several chunks of wax and place them in the oil. This second piece of wax was actually cut on the bandsaw, which turns out to be a much better method. I usually add about 25% wax by volume. Give the mixture a good stir and be sure to turn off the hot plate as soon as the wax is melted. I like to use a clean paper towel to spread a liberal coat of the oil wax mixture on the surface. But be very careful with the oil just in case it's too hot. After covering the entire surface, I let the board sit for about an hour or so. At that time, you might notice droplets of oil pulling on the surface. Just wipe these away with a clean rag and let the board sit overnight. Day two, I give the board a second coat of the oil wax mixture and once again let it sit overnight. Finally, on day three, you should have a nice waxy board. I like to remove most of the excess wax with a paper towel and do my final buffing with a clean cotton rag. And when it's all said and done, you should have a nicely protected board. Now the second method, which is actually my preferred method, is to coat the board with a wiping varnish. You can buy varnish specifically for food items under the name Salad Bowl Finish, something like this. Now my favorite is made by General Finishes and it's available at rockler.com. I'll post a link to that in the write-up. I happen to have a can here of Balin's, which works just fine. Now, this is my preferred finish for a few reasons. First, I find it to be much more durable than mineral oil. The finish can take quite a beating. Now, second, it's much faster and cleaner to apply. Third, it truly seals the surface, making it less prone to harboring bacteria. Fourth, it doesn't need to be recoated nearly as often as a mineral oil board does. And fifth, I just think it looks a lot better. I begin by thinning my varnish about 50% with mineral spirits. With a clean cotton rag, I apply a nice liberal coat and keep applying the varnish as long as the grain keeps pulling it in. I stop after three to four minutes, even if the board looks like it can take more. At that point, if you turn the board over, you might even notice that the finish actually traveled all the way through the board. And after eight to 12 hours, I recoat the entire surface using long, smooth strokes and let the board dry for another eight to 12 hours. Before the final coat, I give the board a light sanding with 400 grit paper and then I apply my final coat of varnish. The important thing to remember here is that we're not trying to build a finish, we're just trying to seal off moisture. Now I know a lot of you are wondering, can I just use a regular varnish? Well, my answer would be yes and no. Now, I've read on numerous occasions that nearly all finishes are non-toxic when cured. This does make sense to me since all the toxicity is contained in the thinner and the drier additives. But as a guy with a scientific background, I've got trouble accepting the word of an author if they don't list real scientific sources, and most of these articles don't. But if there are trace levels of toxic chemicals left in a cured finish, I really don't think it's possible for someone to consume enough of it through normal cutting board usage for it to make any difference at all. Now, I'm sure you take in more toxic chemicals every time you walk through a cloud of cigarette smoke or car exhaust. But when it comes to my family's safety and that of my customers, I really have no choice but to use a product that is labeled as food safe. And it's probably not a bad idea for you to do the same. A mineral oil cutting board should be recoded as needed. Monthly should be adequate. For a mineral oil and wax board, you probably want to add a light coat of oil wax mixture to the surface and buff it out. Now, one of the great advantages of the varnish board is the fact that it doesn't require monthly maintenance. 
but eventually you will see some knife marks in the finish. In order to hide them as well as seal them, I like to give the surface a very quick wipe of mineral oil. I basically put a few drops on a paper towel, rub the oil into the scratches, and then wipe off the excess and the board is going to look great. Now regardless of the finish type, cutting boards are very simple to clean. Just use some hot water and a little soap. What? Dry the board thoroughly with a paper towel and set it on end for at least a few hours. This will allow the board to dry thoroughly. Now, if you have a varnish board, you can usually skip that step. Just wipe off the excess water with a paper towel and place the board right back on the countertop. Now, if you start looking for food safe finishes, you're bound to find a few products containing walnut oil. Although this oil makes a great finish, it could potentially be hazardous to someone with a nut allergy. And from what I understand, nut allergies are nothing to mess with. So just play it safe and skip the walnut oil. I'd also avoid using lacquer and shellac. Uh, both of these finishes are very hard, but they won't really stand up to the abuse of a knife. Not to mention, they're pretty pricey. But keep in mind that shellac itself makes a great child safe finish for toys and uh, even baby furniture. In fact, most of the shellac in the U.S. is usually used in the food and pharmaceutical industries. So while I don't recommend chewing on your furniture, I suppose you could. <laughs> With proper care and maintenance, your cutting board should give you and your family years of service. When the board starts looking really rough, just take it back into the shop, give it a thorough sanding, and simply reapply your finish of choice, and the board will look like new. Now, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to email us at thewoodwhisperer at gmail.com. And I'd also like to mention a few other woodworking resources out there that you might find fun and useful. First, there's another really great podcast out there called Matt's Basement Workshop. The website is mattswoodshop.libsyn.com. Now this guy's really the pioneer of woodworking podcasting. I know when I was doing research for my podcast, Matt Show was the only game in town. He's got some really great information and some awesome tips over there, so make sure you check him out. Another excellent resource is lumberjocks.com. This site is really a social gathering place for woodworkers of all types. You can participate in the forums and even create your own weblog. And right now, they're taking entries for their 2007 Woodworking Awards, so head over to lumberjocks.com and check that out too. That's all for today, so thanks for watching. Bye bye